Hello everybody, hope you're having a good day. It's going to be a nice day here weather-wise. Uh, however, uh, some places it's not going to be. So, hope you can deal with whatever weather you have and make the best of it. The fact is, if you woke up today, then that means God has given you another chance to do something for Him. And we encourage you to do that. Alright, our lesson today is called the Beatitudes of Revelation. And there are seven Beatitudes in Revelation. This is des by design. You know, seven represents a perfect number, and in the symbolic language, one cannot improve upon it by any means used. So, Beatitudes means happiness and good. I mean, signified by the word blessed. You know, just like Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount, he, he has the Beatitudes there, blessed, blessed, blessed. And so Revelation also has this, and it shouldn't surprise us because as we start the New Testament, we have the Beatitudes, and as we end the New Testament, we have the Beatitudes also. And so we're, we're going to read these Beatitudes, and then we're going to make some comments with each one, making reference to a lot of scripture. See, in Revelation 1.3, it starts off, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. All right, Colossians 4, 16, and it reads, and when this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, 27, he says, I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. And 1 Timothy 4.13 says, Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. So these passages speak of communication, and specifically communicating the word and the message that comes from God. So to either read or have read so that you can hear what you need to know. I mean, that's our purpose of learning. In Revelation 2 and 3, the phrase here is spoken to each of the seven churches. And in other words, the message that was being communicated was to be understood and heeded. You know, hear and understand is what was told to them. Jesus used that phrase one time, hear and understand. And so, obviously, what God was communicating was important to pay attention to and to live by. You know, Luke eleven twenty eight 28 says, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Now, the second beatitude is then found in Revelation 14 and verse 13. It says, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. See, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So the idea of being in Christ is where we dwell when we obey the gospel. You know, Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, in Christ is where we have all spiritual blessings. See, outside of Christ, we don't have any of these blessings, but in Christ we do. Ephesians 1, 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So in Christ is where we find salvation. You know, Acts 2, 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number daily, but day by day, those who were being saved. And so we also find that we shall find rest for our souls. You know, Jesus spoke of that in Matthew 11, 28 and 29. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. 
I mean, that, that, this rest for your souls is also similar to the, the peace that passes all understanding that we find there in Philippians 4 and verse 6 or 7. All right. In Matthew, uh, in Hebrews 4, verse 1, it says, Therefore, let us fear, lest while a promise remains of entering his rest, and any one of you should seem to have come short of it. See, we're talking about the rest that he promises there. And there's a warning to not miss out on the rest that God has prepared for his people. Because remember with the, the Old Testament Israelites in the wilderness, he said, they shall not enter my rest. And he waited 40 years and let that generation pass away and allowed the next generation to come in to the promised land. All right, so Hebrews 4, 9 and 10 says, there remains therefore a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. So yes, we, and we read in the several passages in the Old Testament, on the, sixth, on the seventh day, God rested. In other words, all of his creation, he said that was good. And on the seventh day, he rested and that's why the seventh day, the Sabbath day, was to be kept holy. Because God rested, so you should also. So if we are faithful and in the Lord, we will no longer have to work at all. I mean, this is when our life is over. And we shall cease from labor and will receive our reward. So we must work while it is still day, John 9, 4. As long as we're alive in the human body, we need to be working the best we can for the Lord's kingdom. And then after we pass away, then we'll enter his rest. So our admonition to all still living is to be faithful until death, just like we read in Revelation 2, 18, and to remain steadfast. I mean, 1 Corinthians 15 and 58. Jesus said, be faithful until the end. The next beatitude is in Revelation 16 and verse 15. It says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his garments, lest he walk about naked and men see his shame. You know, when Jesus comes, we'll be at a time we do not know or expect. I mean, that's why several times it's mentioned he'll come like a thief in the night. And we... We find out several parables in, in the, the New Testament and the Gospels where Jesus talked about the night watchman's duty uh, and the importance of it because that's when most of the crime took place was at night. And so the watchman was supposed to be watchful of that. He says, always be ready. You don't know when he's coming back. See, that's what he says, Matthew 24, 43 and 44. But be sure of this, that if... If the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you be ready too. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. So the idea of being clothed is to be ready to go. I mean, see, the children of Israel were to observe the Passover feast fully clothed and with their shoes on in preparation to depart. And, and so we are to clothe ourselves with Christ. And so Galatians 3:27, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And then we talk about the shame of the nakedness. Shame seems to be something absent from our society and our culture these days. See, those who try to be righteous would be ashamed if their nakedness was exposed to others. And the wicked are proud to show their nakedness and really do want you to be offended by their actions. And they really don't care if you're offended by their actions. They're going to show it off anyway. All right. The next beatitude is Revelation 19 and verse 9. And he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and he said to me, these are true words of God. Now, the marriage supper is the same as marriage feast. And so those who are invited, invited is the same as being called. See, in 2 Thessalonians 2.14, and it was for this, he called you through our gospel 
that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Romans 8, 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And then in Luke 14, 15 through 24, Jesus tells a parable about a feast, a wedding feast that had been prepared and guests were invited but when the time came, they told the servants, well, we don't have time. We've got other things to do. And they began to make excuses. And so the master said, well, compel others to come in. Go out in the highways and bring people in to my feast. All right. The next uh, beatitude is Revelation 20 and verse 6. It said, blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. All right, several things. Having part. I mean, that, that means sharing, participation, portion, or fellowship. Uh, and so, yes, that's how we have a part in the workings of God and having a part in the first resurrection. Romans 6, 3 through 11 talks about the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is symbolized through our baptism. And John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus spoke to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Now, the resurrection is part of the foundation of the gospel. We read in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 1 through 4, and then uh, verse 4 uh, continuing, it says that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to Scripture. And so the second death that he's talking about uh, would have no power. Now in Revelation 2, 11, it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. All right, now we must be careful about what the priest reference and reigning means. All right, so yeah, we're all supposed to be priests of God. I mean, we're, we're told that. But the idea that they will reign, I mean, they're, 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 we just have to be careful that this is symbolic language, and we should not read anything into it that we cannot support by the rest of Scripture. And so, and of course, the thousand years is just symbolic uh, of... Uh, just a period of time. There's, it's not, the length is not necessarily in human time. You know, it, like it said, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day to the Lord. So he, he's not on the same clock that we're on. And, and so uh, we just have to be careful sometimes when we read that. I mentioned we are priests of God. I mean, First Peter uh, 2 and verse 9 we are a royal priesthood, which means we serve God and we proclaim his excellencies. We proclaim his gospel message and what he does for mankind. In 1 Corinthians 6, 2, it says we judge the world by our righteousness. And all this is saying is that we, can, we prove we can do what God's, God wants uh, in his word. I mean, that's how we judge the world. See, most of the world looks at the word of God Oh, that's too hard. I, nobody can do that. And then here we are. We as faithful Christians, we are doing what God wants us to do. So in a sense, that is judging the world. I mean, we're, we're demonstrating it can be done. And them not doing it is a failure on their part. So that's how it says we judge the world. In 1 John 3, 2, he says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him just as he is. You know, Colossians 3, 4 also mentions the fact that we will reign with him. We will be like him. We will reign with him. And so, uh, it's just the language that, yes, we're all going to be part of this thing together. All right, Revelation 22, 7 is the next beatitude. It says, and behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. 
you know, very similar to what was said earlier. And it's a warning that we need to be paying attention to because we know he who adds to it or he who takes away from it, I mean, they're going to face strict, harsh punishment because of it. So we recognize we're going to be judged by the words of Christ. And John 12, 48 and 49, he who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me commandment what to say and what to speak. Now, the importance of this is really the fact that uh, technically the entire Bible is the words of Christ. I mean, this is God's message to mankind. And the Holy Spirit was directed to impart this information to mankind. And so, technically, the entire Bible is the word of Christ, whether it was written by the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, Jude, or, or James. I mean, it really doesn't matter. I mean, whether it was written by Moses, uh, Joshua, and, and Ezra the scribe, really does not matter because they're all the word of God. And folks, we need to treat it as the word of God. When people can start breaking it down, say, well, that's what Ezra wrote. It doesn't apply to me because he lived 2,700 years or 2,500 20, years ago. Oh, no, no, no. Folks, <clears throat> if it's in God's word, it's important and you need to pay attention. I mean, there's just no other way of saying that. See, our love is demonstrated by our obedience to God's word. He said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then in John 14, 24, it says, he who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. Yeah, there's a lot of people saying, I love Jesus, but then they just go and do their own thing. They don't obey what he says. You know, Hebrews 5 and verse 9 says, he's the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. Those who don't obey him are not going to have that salvation that they think they're going to get. See, they've been deceived and they've been lied to and they really don't search the truth, search for the truth enough. And so what? Second Thessalonians 2 says God's going to let them believe the lie because they did not love the truth so as to be saved. And so, <clears throat> all the words and commands of God are important for our salvation. Every word of God is important. That's what Jesus told Satan. Every word of God is important. The last beatitude we're going to mention in the seventh one is Revelation 22 and verse 14. It says, Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. <clears throat> See, the washing of robes means that they have been cleansed. I mean, this is done for us. It's through baptism. Acts 22, 16, And now why do you delay? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So we're cleansed by the blood of Christ. When we read 1 John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And then in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that's what the blood of Christ does to it. We access that blood through baptism initially, and then through prayer and confession, uh, we, we're able to receive that cleansing continually, if you want to look at it that way, as long as we are confessing and being faithful. I mean, it's not, it's not really an automatic thing like some people want to suggest. No, it, it, it really isn't. But uh, yes, he does cleanse us every time we ask. Now, he's talking about the tree of life, the right to the tree of life. The tree of life is symbolic of eternal life. 
In Genesis 3, Adam and Eve were removed from the garden. Why? Lest they eat from, from the, lest they reach out and take from the tree of life and live forever. I mean, so they could have lived forever if they had stayed close to that tree, but God cast them out and they did not have access to it. So they began the death process, the dying process. The, the idea of what we all are cursed with is the fact that we're all going to continue living, getting older, and then we're going to die. I mean, that's just a fact of life. And it was basically brought to us, death was brought to us because of the sin of Adam and Eve. All right. Now, heaven will be the eternal and never end. See, the gates represent the entrance into that city of heaven, the eternal abode of God. Throughout the scriptures, sometimes it talks about gates. Sometimes gates were described as an entrance passage. I think Ezekiel talks about the, the requirements to enter the gates, which was, I, I think, kind of a, a precursor to the gospel. I mean, it's basically, there are certain conditions people have to be in in order to walk through these gates. Jesus said, I am that gate. Well, what do we have to do? We have to, first of all, believe that Jesus is the Son of God and then change our ways through repentance, confess his name, be baptized into Christ. And that's how we enter into Christ is through baptism. Jesus called himself the gate or the door. And so I think Ezekiel talked about this around chapter 42 and chapter 43. Uh, about the entrance has has strict requirements to enter into it, and I think that's just kind of a, a type of the um, the entrance by the gospel. All right, so now it it talks about the fact blessed and happy is the one who does what God wants him or her to do. So, folks, th these are the beatitudes of Revelation, and it's good to pay attention to them and. And run your references if you have a reference Bible. I mean, who, who can take these phrases? And we can find these phrases throughout the scriptures and, and see these things. There, there, there's nothing new in Revelation. I mean, I, I've said this for years. That, and there's nothing new in Revelation that wasn't already given to us as far as doctrine is, is uh, commanded. I mean, so... These are all just instructions to the people of God. And yes, it was written in symbolic language, probably for various reasons, but it was something that the people of Revelation who read this could understand, and they knew what it meant. Too many times, because of the symbolic language, people have thrown in applications and made, made statements that really taken it totally out of context and trying to say, well, well, look here, the, the Osama bin Laden, I mean, he's described in Revelation, or, or Saddam Hussein, or Adolf Hitler, or Mussolini, or the Kaiser, somebody. I mean, people are trying to bring Revelation to fit the here and now when Revelation was meant for them back then. That was to come shortly. And, and so... And, of course, that was something that was going to exist. I think the book of Revelation is still applicable to us and the fact that it basically describes the, the, the battle between good and evil, between the church and the world, between Christ and uh, Satan. I mean, and, of course, we know Christ is going to be victorious, and that's where we need to be. Okay, so by... Doing God's commands, one prepares himself or herself to enter heaven. And there's no greater blessing can be imagined by the human mind than this. So, have you prepared yourself to be blessed? And the only way that's going to happen is by doing what God wants you to do. And that's by learning what God wants you to do in the pages of his Bible and doing it. So think about these things. That's our lesson for today. It's a simple lesson, but one that we do need to pay attention to from time to time. If you have the opportunity, share this message with others and learn from it. And um, we're, we're going to end it here. Uh, you have a good day, and Lord willing, be back again with another message. Bye-bye.